Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your multiple blessings, especially we thank you for your word, a sure guide in a world that is so confused. I ask that as we study your word that you will help us to handle it reverently and respectfully, that we will hear your voice speaking and not impose on scripture our own ideas. So please be with us through the ministry of your Holy Spirit. Bless those who watch this program, open their hearts that they might receive. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. After Jesus gave the signs of his soon coming, he went on to warn his people that they needed to watch, to pray, and to work while they were waiting for him to come. When Jesus said that no one knew the day or hour of his coming, was he referring to the second coming? Or perhaps is there a deeper truth to this expression, no one knows the day or the hour? Let's read Matthew 24, verse 36 to 44, which is the next passage in the chapter that we are studying. It says there in verse 36, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. This is Jesus speaking. As the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, at the mill, one will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So the question is, is this coming of Jesus as a thief referring to the second coming of Christ, or is it referring to something that will happen just before the second coming of Christ? Now, the formula that you have here, as it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be at the coming of the Son of Man, is what theologians call typology. In other words, the flood story is the type, and what happens at the end of time is the anti-type, or the fulfillment. So in order to understand the anti-type, we must understand the type. We must go back to the flood story in the Old Testament, and that is found in Genesis chapters 6 through 9. I want you to notice four key points of time in the flood story. First, we have the preaching and the building period. This is a probationary period for everyone on earth. In other words, during this time, the door of probation is open for a period of 120 years. During this time, Noah preached empowered by the Holy Spirit. In fact, he did not preach a smooth message, a politically correct message. He denounced the sins of the antediluvians and called them to repent and to straighten out their ways. During this time, the Spirit strove with the antediluvian race, attempting to lead them to repentance. This is what we're said, what is said in Genesis 6, verse 3. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. So God says, My spirit is not going to strive forever with human beings. I'm giving them 120 years of opportunity or grace to repent and to straighten out their ways. The word that is used here, strive, actually is translated most of the time in the Old Testament as to plead a cause, to contend, or to judge. 
In other words, the message of Noah was a message of judgment. His message would divide the world into two groups, those who were inside the ark and those who were outside the ark. So he preached a judgment hour message under the power of the Holy Spirit. Actually the flood story doesn't tell us that Noah preached, but the New Testament does. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5 we find that God did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. So Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He called the world to repent and to live righteous lives. But Noah not only preached, he also worked, he built. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7 we find these words, By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Noah backed up his words by his actions. He had a faith that worked. He invested all his time, his efforts, his strength, his talents, his resources into the building of the ark. Everybody else was saving for a rainy day. Building the ark for Noah was not one priority among many, it was the top priority and I would say the only priority. Hebrews tells us that Noah condemned the world not by his preaching but by his building. His actions proved that he believed his message. You see building a gigantic ship on dry ground when it had never, never rained took great faith. It shows that Noah believed God. He trusted God's word even though every evidence showed that there could not be a flood. Faith simply means trusting God enough to do what God says. However, you cannot trust God unless you love Him, and you cannot love Him unless you know Him, and you cannot know Him unless you spend time with Him. So Noah preached, and Noah showed that he believed what he preached because he built a ship on dry land. Judged by numerical standards, Noah's evangelistic crusade was a tragic failure. Just imagine there were millions of people that lived on this planet before the flood, and only eight persons responded to his message, and all were members of his own family. If the story of Noah represents what will happen at the end of time, do you suppose that the majority of human beings will be on the Lord's side, or perhaps it will be the minority? Noah's message was contrary to historical, empirical, sensorial, rational, and scientific evidence. The idea of a universal flood was absolutely preposterous in the minds of those who lived before the flood. You see, before creation week we're told that the earth was filled with water. That's in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2. On the second day of creation God took part of the water and placed it under the earth and took the other part of the water and placed it above the earth, kind of like a canopy to create a, a climate that was uniform all over the world. You say, how was the earth watered then if it wasn't watered by rain? Well, Genesis chapter 2 verses 5 and 6 tells us that the earth had kind of an automatic sprinkler system. At certain times of the day a mist rose from the earth to water the entire earth. God did not have to create water when He brought the flood. All He had to do was bring the water from above and the water from below to fill the planet as it had been before creation week. And so we're told that God broke up the fountains of the great deep and He opened the windows of heaven, brought down the water that He had placed up there, and brought up the water that He had placed beneath. Let us just imagine for a few moments 
what the experts in the world must have said when they heard Noah preaching his message and building the ark. Let's imagine the, the Department of Natural Sciences. The people probably said, it has never rained before. Everything has continued uniformly as from the beginning. What Noah is preaching is contrary to sound science. It is preposterous to believe that water could fall from heaven and rise from the earth. It's a scientific impossibility. I imagine what the theology departments were saying. Noah focuses too much on our sins. God is a God of loves. He loves the world too much to destroy it. Besides, rain from heaven would require a miracle, and nature works on the basis of fixed laws, so there can be no such things as miracles. What would the history department have been saying? There is no historical record of any flood in the past, so why should we believe that there could be one now? What would the Department of Behavioral Sciences have to say? Well, Noah is suffering an imaginary mental delusion. He is confusing reality with fantasy. He is mentally deranged. The sociology department might say, we must not allow a lunatic like Noah to disrupt the stable order of society. And the philosophy department might have said, Noah is suffering because of an existential void in his life. What's truth for Noah is not necessarily truth for everyone else. Perhaps arguments such as these were being used to try and prove that the flood would never come. These were the voices of the experts of that day. So the first point of time is the preaching and the building of Noah, while the door of probation is opening, open, God is judging the world by the response that people give to the message that Noah is preaching. Now we come to the second point of time, the moment when the door shuts. When Noah concluded his preaching and his building, he and his family entered the ark. The Spirit then ceased to strive with human hearts. The Spirit of God was withdrawn. Preaching had come to an end. Everyone's choice was final. The world at this moment had only two groups, those who were inside the ark and those who were outside. The sealed inside and those marked for destruction outside. But before the door was closed, God gave one last spectacular sign to try and convince the people before the flood that the flood was going to come. And that is when the animals came into the ark in perfect order. It wasn't the case as in the Hollywood version where Noah's sons are roping the animals and pulling them to the ark. No, they came and they marched into the ark in perfect order. We find that in Genesis 7 and verse 16. So those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. In other words, the Lord shut the door. Ellen White in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 98, had this to say about the shutting of the door. Noah was shut in, and the rejectors of God's mercy were shut out. The seal of heaven was on that door. God had shut it, and God alone could open it. This reminds us of Matthew 24, when the first destruction of Jerusalem took place. There were two groups, those that stayed and were destroyed, and those who fled. In the same way, in the days of Noah, those who entered the ark had the seal of God, they were saved, and those who were outside the ark were destroyed. At the end, the faithful will have the seal of God, and the unfaithful will have the mark of the beast. So when that door shut, probation closed. Why did God shut Noah and his family in the ark? For two reasons. First of all, to protect, protect them from the rage of the people of the lost outside the ark. And secondly, to spare them from the destruction that would come as a result of the flood. Once Noah was inside with his family and the wicked were outside, there was no 
changing sides. All cases had been decided. The judgment hour message of Noah had divided the world into two groups. Now we go to point number three. After the door of mercy closed, Noah remained inside the ark with his family, and the wicked were outside for a period of seven days. Notice Genesis chapter 7 and verse 4. For after seven more days, I will cause it to rain on the earth, forty days and forty nights, and I will destroy from the face of the earth all living things that I have made. Have you ever wondered why God kept Noah and his family inside that ark with all of those animals for a period of seven days before it actually rained? Could God have made it rain immediately? Of course He could have. There must be a purpose for which God let them, left them in the ark seven days before it began to rain. Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 98 and 99, explains, For seven days after Noah and his family entered the ark, there appeared no sign of the coming storm. During this period, listen carefully now, their faith was tested. Imagine one day passes, two, three, four, five, six, seven, because it started raining on the eighth day, and uh, nothing happens. The people outside become more violent. Those inside, they're wondering, perhaps were we wrong in coming into the ark? Their faith was tested. It was a time of triumph to the world without. The apparent delay confirmed them in their belief that Noah's message was a delusion and that the flood would never come. Notwithstanding the solemn scenes which they had witnessed, the beasts and birds entering the ark, and the angel of God closing the door, they still continued their sport and revelry, even making a jest of these signal manifestations of God's power. They gathered in crowds about the ark, deriding its inmates with a daring violence which they had never ventured upon before. So they were saved inside from the violence of the multitude and also from the destruction that would come. During this time, the faith of those inside the ark was severely tested. God would fulfill His word. They believed, but they had to wait for God to act. It was a day of victory for those outside the ark. It was a day of apparent ridicule and defeat for those who were inside the ark. Ellen White compared the shut door in the days of Noah with the shut door when probation closes. This quotation is from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 98. Likewise, when Christ shall cease His intercession for guilty men, before His coming, this is important, Likewise, when Christ shall cease His intercession for guilty men before His coming in the clouds of heaven, the door of mercy will be shut. Then divine grace will no longer restrain the wicked, and Satan will have full control of those who have rejected mercy. They will endeavor to destroy God's people. Notice, just like the wicked outside the ark were furious with those who were inside. But as Noah was shut into the ark, so the righteous will be shielded by divine power. You see, probation is going to close before Jesus comes. And after probation closes comes the time of trouble, such as never has been seen. God's people will remain on the earth during this period. Their faith will be severely tested. The wicked will surround them to try and destroy them. They will cry out day and night to God for justice and for vengeance, as we're told in the story of the widow, the persistent widow in Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. Let's go to point number four, the actual destruction on the eighth day. Genesis chapter 7, 11 describes this cataclysm. It says, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. In other words, the water that God placed above was brought down, and the water that He placed beneath was brought up. Ellen White in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 99, actually saw this terrible destruction while she was in vision. Here's the description. Water appeared to come from the clouds in mighty cataracts, 
Rivers broke away from their boundaries and overflowed the valleys. Jets of water burst from the earth with indescribable force, throwing massive rocks hundreds of feet into the air. And these, in falling, buried themselves deep in the ground. As the violence of the storm increased, trees, buildings, rocks, and earth were hurled in every direction. The terror of man and beast was beyond description. Above the roar of the tempest was heard the wailing of a people that had despised the authority of God. As I was reading this quotation, it brought to mind the tsunami that hit northeastern, the northeastern area of Honshu, Japan on March 11, 2011. The waves reached a height of 30 feet as they barreled across the 18-foot restraining wall and the floodwaters moved, into, moved inland as much as six miles. The flood, and you remember seeing this, uh, many of you, the flood swept away buildings, houses, cars, animals, people, and in a matter of minutes, 20,000 people perished. Now imagine an event like this, but not on a local scale, but on a global scale. You know, the normal word for flood in the New Testament is potamos, where we get the word hippopotamos. Hippopotamus means that it, it uh, swims underwater. However, Matthew chapter 24, when it refers to the flood, does not use the common word potamos. It used the word, uses the word cataclysmos. In other words, the flood was a cataclysm. Now the question is, what happened with Satan during the flood? In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 99, we find these words, Satan himself, who was compelled to remain in the midst of the warring elements, feared for his own existence. God bound Satan to this earth during the flood, and we're told that he, that he actually feared for his own existence. And during the time of the flood, the heavens were dark, the earth was totally covered with water, at the beginning, and not one human being was left alive on planet earth. So just like before creation, darkness covered the earth. The earth was totally covered with water, and there were no inhabitants yet. Now why have I told all this story? Because we're dealing with typology. As it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. In Matthew chapter 24, verses 36 to 39, we notice that Jesus applied what happened at the flood to the end of time. Let's read Matthew 24, verses 36 through 41. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, notice, as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. Very important, verse 39. And did not know, that is those outside the ark, did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two, women, two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, at the mill, one will be taken and the other left. Did you notice that in these verses the word until appears twice? Once again, I review. It says that uh, they were carrying on business as usual before the flood. They were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. There's the first until. Until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not know until the flood came and took them all away. Two points of time, just like we noticed in this story in the Old Testament. You see, at the end of time, the door of probation is going to close before the destruction comes, just like happened at the time of the flood. Now, uh, let's notice th the way that Jesus referred to this particular experience. Let's go to Matthew chapter 24, and we'll read verses 42 through 44. Jesus said, 
Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. So the question is, is that talking about the second coming? We don't know the hour of the second coming. That's true, but there's a deeper truth. We don't know when the door of probation is going to close either, like those before the flood, the door closed. They didn't realize they were lost until it started to rain. So Jesus says, watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So here Jesus is comparing his coming with the coming of a thief at night. When everybody is sleeping in the house, they're not watching. What is the point here? Once again, the coming of the thief has two points of time. You say, what do you mean two points of time? Well, imagine everybody is sleeping in the house and uh, deep in sleep, I might say. And so the thief comes and he finds the door of the house open. And he comes into the house and steals uh, all of the valuables that he finds in the house. He goes out the front door quietly. Everybody in the house is totally unaware that the thief has come. When do they discover that the thief has visited them? It's the next morning when they wake up, but it's too late. So it is with the coming of Jesus. First of all, the door of probation closes. The world will be unaware that the door of probation has closed. And then we have a period of tribulation during which the wicked will be totally oblivious to the idea that the door of probation has closed because they weren't watching. They will only realize that uh, they were lost when the destruction comes upon the world. Let me read you from the book Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 98 and 99, about the antitype of the closed door. Ellen White wrote, and she's, do, she's now applying the experience before the flood to the end of time. So when Christ shall cease his intercession for guilty men, before his coming in the clouds of heaven, the door of mercy will be shut. Then divine grace will no longer restrain the wicked, and Satan will have full control of those who have rejected his mercy. They will endeavor to destroy God's people, but as Noah was shut into the ark, so the righteous will be shielded by divine power. She continues, For seven days after Noah and his family entered the ark, there appeared no sign of the coming storm. During this period their faith was tested. It was a time of triumph to the world without. The apparent delay confirmed them in the belief that Noah's message was a delusion and the flood would never come. Now, it's very interesting to notice that the order of events in Matthew 24 and the order of events in the flood story run parallel. Let me just go through this quickly. First of all, Matthew 24, verse 14, you have the preaching of the gospel to all the world and then the end will come. That's parallel to Noah preaching the message before the closing of the door and before the destruction of the flood came. In Revelation, we find also a parallel. In the book of Revelation, we are told that the everlasting gospel will be preached by the first angel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. So there's a parallel between Matthew 24, Revelation chapter 14, and the flood in the days of Noah. Let's notice another parallel. You have in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 15, after the preaching of the gospel, you have the abomination of desolation set up. This divides the inhabitants of Jerusalem into two groups, those who are saved and those who are lost, those who flee the city and those who stay. In other words, the abomination of desolation, the sign divides the world into two groups. Did this happen in the days of Noah? It most certainly did. In the days of Noah, when the door closed, you had two groups. You had those who were inside the ark and those who were outside the ark when the preaching ceased. What about in the book of Revelation? Do you also have the saved and the lost? 
Yes, we have the seal of God, which the righteous will have, which, by the way, is the observance of God's holy Sabbath. And then the lost have the mark of the beast when the door of probation closes. So you have the two groups also. Do you also have the tribulation symbolized in all three sources? In Matthew 24, in the days of Noah, and in the book of Revelation. Absolutely. You'll notice in Matthew chapter 24, verses 16 to 21, that God's people flee and they go through the great tribulation. What about in the days of Noah? They're inside the ark seven days. The wicked outside are ever more violent every day. And then what about the book of Revelation? Yes, God's people are going to go through the time of trouble. The wicked will surround them and intend to destroy them, but they will be shielded by divine power, just like those who fled from Jerusalem, just like Noah and his family were protected inside the ark. And then, of course, you have the destruction of the wicked at the second coming of Jesus Christ. And you have also uh, the destruction of the world, where the wicked are destroyed and the saved are spared. And at the days of Noah, you have also those who survived, Noah and his family, and those who were destroyed, those who were outside. So you'll notice that there's a parallel between these three events. Matthew chapter 24, and the days of Noah, and the book of Revelation. Now, this story is given as a warning to us. I want you to notice this rather lengthy statement that we find in the book Great Controversy, page 491. It's lengthy, and I hate to read because people get distracted, but this is a powerful statement, so I'm going to take the time to read it. When the work of the investigative judgment closes... The destiny of all will have been decided for life or death. Probation ends a short time before the appearing of the Lord in the clouds of heaven. Christ in the Revelation, looking forward to that time, declares, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And then we have the second coming. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. And then she comments, The righteous and the wicked will still be living upon the earth in their mortal state. Men will be planting and building, eating and drinking, all unconscious that the final irrevocable decision has been pronounced in the sanctuary above. So they're unaware that probation is closed in the sanctuary above. Just like those outside the ark were unaware that probation had closed when the door closed. They thought that those inside were wrong in their belief. So she continues, Before the flood, after Noah entered the ark, God shut him in and shut the ungodly out. But for seven days, the people not knowing that their doom was fixed, continued their careless, pleasure-loving life, and mocked the warnings of impending judgment. So, says the Savior, shall also the coming of the Son of Man be, silently, unnoticed, as the midnight thief will come the decisive hour that marks the fixing of every man's destiny, the final withdrawal of mercies offered to guilty men. So notice, silently unnoticed as the midnight thief, probation will close, and the lost will be totally oblivious to the fact that the door of mercy is no longer open. The quotation continues. Now she's going to quote from Mark 13, 35 and 36. Watch ye therefore, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. People think, well, this is the second coming of Christ. No, it's not. You see, it's when Jesus comes to the Father to change His garments to return to the earth as King of kings and Lord of lords because He's no longer a priest to intercede for people. She continues, Perilous is the condition of those who, growing weary of their watch, turn to the attractions of the world. While the man of business is absorbed in the pursuit of gain, 
while the pleasure lover is seeking indulgence, while the daughter of fashion is arranging her adornments, it may be in that hour the judge of all the earth will pronounce the sentence, Thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Now I want to read the parallel passage that we find in Mark 13 verses 33 to 37, parallel to the passage that we began with in our study today from Matthew 24. This is how it reads, Mark 13, 33 to 37. Take heed, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It is like a man going to a far country, who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to each his work and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch therefore, Jesus says, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming. You say, well, we don't know the hour of the second coming. Yeah, we don't know the hour of the second coming, but we also don't know when the door of probation is closing, and this is talking about the close of probation. I'm going to show you in a moment. Verse 35 again. Watch therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming. In the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. So in other words, watch so that when he comes suddenly, you, he doesn't find you sleeping. Is that talking about the moment when the people discovered that the thief has come? No, it's talking about the time when the, feast, uh, when the thief comes and nobody knows it until the morning when they realize that everything has been stolen by the thief. Now I've read this passage, let me read you a statement from Ellen White. She understood this. You see, people many times read scripture and they're not careful in their reading. They simply say, oh well, nobody knows the hour and day of His coming, so that's the second coming of Christ. But they don't realize that this is talking about the coming of the thief. And the thief, when the thief comes, those who are not watching, they're caught off guard. They don't know the thief has come. They find out later when they wake up in the morning and the thief has taken all of their goods. This is a remarkable statement from Ellen White. She understood that probation closes before the second coming of Christ. This is a rather lengthy statement also. It's found in volume 2 of the Testimonies, page 190 and 191. She's going to quote the passage that we just read from Mark 13. Jesus has left us word. Now she quotes, Watch ye therefore, for ye do not know when the master of the house cometh, at even, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. She's quoting Mark 13, where it says, a lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. She continues, we are waiting and watching for the return of the master, who is to bring the morning, lest coming suddenly he find us sleeping. And then she asks this question, what time is here referred to? That is, when the return of the master is. What time is referred to here? not to the revelation of Christ in the clouds of heaven to find a people asleep. No, but to His return from His ministration in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, when He lays off His priestly attire and clothes Himself with garments of vengeance. And when the mandate goes forth, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still and he that is holy, let him be holy still. When Jesus ceases to plead for man, the cases of all are forever decided. This is the time of reckoning with his servants. To those, now I want you to notice the key words that I'm going to read following. To those who have neglected, not rejected, neglected, the preparation of purity and holiness, which fits them, to be waiting once to welcome their Lord, the sun sets in gloom and darkness and rises not again. Probation closes. Christ's intercessions cease in heaven. This time finally comes suddenly upon all. And those who have neglected to purify their souls by obeying the truth are found sleeping. They became weary of waiting and watching. They became indifferent in regard to the coming of their master. They longed not for his appearing. 
and thought there was no need of such continued persevering watching. They had been disappointed in their expectations and might be again. They concluded that there was time enough yet to arouse. They would be sure not to lose the opportunity of securing an earthly treasure. It would be safe to get all of this world they could, and in securing this object they lost all anxiety and interest in the appearance of the, and the appearing of their master. They became indifferent and careless, as though his coming were yet in the distance. But while their interest was buried in their worldly gains, the work closed in the heavenly sanctuary and they were unprepared. What a magnificent description that Ellen White gives here based firmly on what we have studied from Scripture. Now let me ask you, what is going to happen after the second coming of Christ? What is going to happen with Satan during the thousand years? You can read it in Revelation 20. We're told that, Revelation, that, that Satan will be bound to planet earth just like at the flood. You remember Patriarchs and Prophets, page 99, Satan himself, who was compelled to remain in the midst of the warring elements, feared for his own existence. So after the second coming, as Satan was bound to this earth at the flood, Satan will be bound to this world for a thousand years. During this period, according to the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 4, verses 19 to 23, the earth will be without form and void like it was before creation, and the planet will be in darkness. All of the wicked will also be dead. We find that in Revelation chapter 20. Satan has lost all of his followers. So basically you have a repetition of what the world was in before creation week. Now is it possible to be notified but surprised? I want to talk to you now about an event that occurred in the country of Colombia many years ago. On Wednesday, November 13, 1985, the eruption of the volcano Nevado del Ruiz caused an avalanche of mud that buried the city of Armero in Colombia. Some 22,000 souls perished in one night. One wonders whether this devastating loss of life could have been prevented. Were there no signs that indicated that the volcano was going to explode and that there was going to be an avalanche of mud? The answer to this question is a resounding yes. There were warnings. In fact, the day after the disaster, I read an article in one of the main newspapers, El Espectador, published by Rodolfo Rodriguez Calderón. The title of the article was Un Desastre Anunciado. In other words, an announced disaster. The disaster was announced ahead of time, in other words. The article makes it clear that every single person in the city of Armero could have saved their lives if they had paid attention to the signs of impending doom, but they chose to ignore the signs. What were the signs? Eleven months before the disaster, the mountain had begun spewing out smoke and ash. The fluffy snow at the top of the mountain became a solid sheet of ice due to the intense heat within the mountain. The water level of the rivers increased significantly due to the melting snow. The cloud of ash and gases, which rose 15 feet high the first day, increased to 750 feet the second day and the day before the eruption, the cloud of ash and gases had reached a height of 16,000 feet. On September 11, the Earth's tremors reached an intensity of 3 on the Mercalli scale. On occasion, people could hear the mountain roar from inside. The authorities had to close the access roads to the mountain ski resort because of the mudslides that totally covered them. It was impossible for people to keep their houses clean because of the volcanic ash that blew into town day in and day out. The people could smell sulfur in the air. The evening when the uh, volcano exploded, there was a torrential rain, according to those who survived, with wind of hurricane proportions that began around 9 p.m. According to the handful of survivors, 
the darkness was unusual and some eyewitnesses that survived said that the darkness was virtually supernatural. Were there enough signs that a disaster was going to take place? Absolutely. So why didn't people flee when they saw all these signs? Move to some other place. This is the sad part of the story. In, in fact, of the multiple, in spite of the ma multiple signs, 22,000 people perished on that fateful night. One wonders whether something similar can happen with regards to the second coming of Christ. Could the second coming catch people by surprise in spite of all of the signs that there are that Jesus is coming soon? Why did the city of Armero choose to ignore these signs? Well, in the same article that I mentioned from the newspaper El Espectador, we have the following information about the reason why the people decided to stay within the city. A priest in the city, Edgar Efren Torres, came over the radio at 7 p.m. that evening and told the people, there is no reason to panic, please stay calm. The civil defense in an official radio release affirmed, there is no reason to be concerned. The bishop of the town, Augusto Osorio, warned against fanatics who were announcing gloom and doom for the city. The mayor of the town said, don't worry. The governor of the state of Tolima, where Armero is found, said later, the disaster could not have been predicted in advance. Colombian scientist Jaime Villegas Velasquez confidently predicted this volcano is not going to erupt, nothing is going to happen. Beware of speculations and exaggerations. The Secretary of Mines, Ivan Duque Escobar, asserted that nothing will happen. Even United States geologist Daryl Hurd said that it was very unlikely that the cities could be buried by rocks, lava, or mud. The Regional Emergency Committee that very evening sent out a message, don't expect your windows to shatter, don't expect darkness, don't expect lava to run down the mountain, don't expect large layers of ash, among other things. The people did not know that probation had closed and destruction was on the way. And very few of those who lived in the city were left. Now this is something very interesting. We need to talk briefly about those who are left and those who are taken. You remember that in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus says one will be taken and the other will be left. Now many, many scholars say that the ones that are left are the ones that stay on earth uh, during the thousand years, uh, the lost, and that those who are taken are the ones who are taken to heaven in the rapture at the second coming. But I believe if you study scripture carefully, the ones who are left are the ones who survive. The ones who are taken are the ones who are destroyed. You know, for example, if there's a flood today and, uh, and the flood takes away a whole town, we say, did the flood take everyone away? Wasn't anyone left? You see, we don't have the time to go through this, but the word left in the Old Testament is a remnant word. It's referring to those who are left after a great calamity, after a great destruction. You know, being that this is talking about the flood, we need to go to Genesis chapter 7 and notice something very interesting. Who is it that was left at the time of the flood and who was taken at the time of the flood? Notice Genesis chapter 7 and I want to read verses 23 and actually 22 and 23. It says there, All in whose nostrils was the breath of the Spirit of life, all that was on the dry land died. So you have one a group that dies. Verse 23, So he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping thing and bird of the air, they were destroyed from the earth. And now notice this. 
only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. This is the New King James Version. But if you read many other versions, it actually says there in verse 23 at the end, only Noah and those who were with him, him in the ark were left. Jesus himself said that the flood took away all of the wicked. So those who were left were Noah and his family. This is a remnant word. Let me just go to one other verse uh, or a couple of verses that use this very same word left to show you that the left are the remnant that are saved. The left are, no, are not those that are left behind according to the famous series of books. Uh, you know, they're not the ones that are left behind while the ones that are taken are the ones that are taken to heaven in the rapture. You know, this, the idea of the rapture is not a biblical idea. Notice Isaiah chapter 4 and let's read verse 2 and verse 3. In that day the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and appealing for those of Israel who have escaped. And it shall come to pass that he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy, everyone who is recorded among the living in Jerusalem. So you'll notice here very clearly that we are told that those who are left in Jerusalem are holy. Now let's notice 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Incidentally, I wrote a little book, uh, and uh, you can get this book from Secrets Unsealed. It's called Taken or Left, where I deal fully with this. It's about a small book, probably about 20 plus pages, and you can get the full explanation of what I'm sharing with you now. So let's go, uh, where did I say we were going? Uh, let's go in our Bibles to um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we've read before uh, this passage, but let's read it again in this new context. Chapter 4 and verse 15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Now notice this. Then we who are alive, and what? And remain, or are left, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. The word left, as I mentioned, is a remnant word. It's what remains after a great, great catastrophe, after a great cataclysm, after a great destruction. So when uh, scripture speaks about the taken and the left, the taken are not those who go to heaven in the rapture seven years before the glorious coming of Christ, and the ones who are left are left here behind alive to suffer the great tribulation. You say, how do we know that? Well, I've shared several ideas with you. Let me share another one with you. In the, in the period of Noah, before the flood, let me ask you, when the flood came, how many groups were there? Were there, first of all, those who survived in the ark, then you have those who were destroyed outside the ark, and you had some people that remained alive outside the ark. Is that the case? No. You have two groups, those who were saved in the ark, Everyone else was destroyed. There was no third group of survivors that were on the earth during the flood that survived the flood. Now why do I bring this to view? Because the rapture idea basically teaches that when Jesus comes for the rapture, He takes His people, His faithful people to heaven, and some on earth will be destroyed when planes crash and cars crash, etc., but there will be a third group that are, that are those who are alive and remain on earth during the tribulation. Futurists call it the tribulation force. So instead of the two groups at the flood, you have suddenly three groups. But there are not three groups. There are two groups. When Jesus comes in power and glory, there will only be two groups. Those who are saved and those who are lost. And by the way, 
I repeat once again how important this is, that when the door of probation closes, everybody is saved or lost. There is no changing sides at that particular point. Now let me end by mentioning one more thing. There will be a corporate close of probation for the entire world. We don't know when that close of probation will be. In other words, there's a close of probation for everyone on planet earth. It is a global close of probation. But there's another close of probation that the Bible speaks of. And this close of probation is individual and personal. It's not global, and it's but it's personal. And by the way, this close of probation can occur at any time. And you say, what are you talking about? Well, the fact is that as long as a person is alive, they are able to choose one of the two sides. That is until the corporate probation for the world closes. People are able to choose to be on one side or on the other side. But when a person dies, their case is closed forever. Probation has closed for that person. So if you don't reach into the time of the corporate global close of probation and you should die today, your case has been decided forever and ever. That's the reason why we need to be certain that we are connected with Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord at every moment of every day. We can't say, oh, there's still time. You know, I can still give my life to the Lord because there's still time. There's no guarantee that there's still time. There's no guarantee that we're going to be alive the next instant. And so the Bible says, today is the day of salvation. Today, if you hear His voice, don't harden your heart. Today, receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. Don't be caught by the close of probation, of individual personal probation, without being prepared. And so, folks, Jesus in Matthew 24 tells us, in summary, that probation will close, the door will close, that's His coming as a thief, closes the door, most of the world will be sleeping, they won't be watching, they're unaware that probation has closed until Jesus comes on the clouds of heaven to destroy those who have not committed their lives to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. My prayer is that we will take this seriously and that we will uh, commit our lives to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ so that He will save us both after probation closes and at His glorious coming. May God bless us and may that be our experience.